morning and welcome to St. Jacob Lutheran Church in our recorded service for August 23rd, 2020. We're so glad that you are with us. My name is Pastor Kurt Buehlenbrock, and today our focus is on Christ's resurrection. No, it's not Easter Sunday, but in the Lutheran Church, uh, it can be Easter Sunday every week because we uh, talk about uh, Christ's uh, gospel and his resurrection. We begin by singing our opening hymn. 234 will sing stanzas 1 through 4 of Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. more than 
we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first lesson for this Sunday is recorded in Daniel chapter 9, reading verses 15 through 18. We read this from Daniel. And now, Lord our, the Lord our God, who you brought, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made a name for yourself to this very day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Although because of our sins the guilt of our, and the guilt of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are viewed with contempt by everyone around us. Now listen, our God, to the prayer of your servant and to his plea for grace, and let your face shine upon your desolate sanctuary for your sake, my Lord. My God, turn your ear toward us and listen. Open your eyes and see the desolation that is upon us and the city that is called by your name. No, it is not because of your, our righteous acts that we are casting our plea for grace before you, but because of your great acts of compassion. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is recorded in Luke chapter 18, reading 9 through 14. This is the familiar parable uh, from some of you, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector. It could be a true event, though. Take notice how uh, the Pharisee prays and then how uh, the tax collector prays. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but he was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of our Lord. We continue by singing, Now I have found the firm foundation. 386, we'll sing stanzas 1 and 4 through 6.
be unto you in peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who was raised again to life for uh, our justification, that we might be saved. Our text is 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 15, reading verses 1 through 10. Brothers, I am going to call your attention to the gospel that I preached to you. You received it and you took your stand on it. You are also being saved by that gospel that was expressed in the words I preached to you. If you keep your hold on it, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to over five hundred brothers at the same time, most of them who are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, Last of all, he appeared to me, the stillborn child, so to speak. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted God's church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. On the contrary, I worked more than all of them, and yet it wasn't my doing, but it was the grace of God which was with me that did it. God of love and peace be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Dear friends in Christ, today is not Easter. This year's Easter Sunday took place back on April 12th. But Easter was different this year because our governor ordered people to stay at home. That meant that businesses and churches were closed. Churches like St. Jacob still celebrated Christ's resurrection, but with a recorded worship service. The, the, Christi the Christians worship the resurrected Christ at home with their family. 1 Corinthians 15 is published in our hymnal, uh, Christian Worship, uh, with the three-year lectionary, and it's put as the second lesson for Easter Sunday in Series C, or the Resurrection of Our Lord. This church year, our lessons have been taken from the historic series of the Lutheran Church. The historic series was developed decades ago. Why the creator or the creators of the historic series selected 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 10 for the 11th Sunday after Trinity is not clear to me. They may have wanted to clearly define the gospel or to focus on Paul's admission as being the worst of sinners. Today may seem like Easter to you, but then every Sunday in the confessional in the confessional Lutheran Church with confessional pastors proclaims Christ's resurrection. In order to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to know God's law. God's law states that because of the original sin we inherited from our parents and the sins that we commit, we will be condemned to sentence or sentenced to eternal punishment. Ever since Adam and Eve uh, defied God by eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin has corrupted the world and everything in it. Adam and Eve's nature was flawed, and they passed that flawed or sinful nature onto their children, their grandchildren, and to us. God's Word explains how this occurred in Romans. So then, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread through all people because all sinned. God's law expects us to obey, obey his commands perfectly, as the Lord said to Moses, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this means completely, as God's word says in James, Whoever keeps the whole law, but stumbles in just one point, has become guilty of breaking all of it. No human can do that. We need help, and the power of the Holy Spirit provides that help in the gospel. Today we will look at one, at the most important teaching of the Christian faith with the theme, Christ's resurrection is a fact. How many of you have never heard that Jesus rose from the dead? Has anyone here never heard that Jesus, God's Son, was born into this world, lived a perfect life, suffered and died on the cross, and rose again on the third day? If you haven't, you don't need to raise your hand. But today you will hear how Jesus lived died and rose and why he did it for the rest of you who have heard the gospel before paul exhorts you remember what you were taught 
Like many Americans, the sophisticated Greeks, the idea of a bodily resurrection was foolishness. It is not surprising then that there were some Corinthians who were denying this important teaching and were influencing the Christians in Corinth. The Apostle Paul had worked in Corinth for a year and a half. After he left, various problems developed. The Christians in Corinth took each other to court. They neglected to discipline people living in open and sin. They were confused about Christian freedom and matters of adiaphora. And some false teachers who denied the resurrection were putting doubt in the minds of Christians. Paul calls Christians in Corinth brothers. In brotherly love, he is concerned about their spiritual welfare. They had heard the gospel from his very lips when they were with him. They had uh, believed and been firmly convinced of Christ's resurrection. Through faith in that gospel message, they were saved. But no longer did they held, but if they no longer held firmly to the real resurrection of Jesus, then they were no longer saved. If you claim to believe the gospel but deny Christ's resurrection, that would be believing in vain and you are no longer saved. Like some in Corinth, if you believed in the gospel years ago, but now you no longer accept that Jesus literally rose again to life, it doesn't help you now or in eternity. Our text reminds the Christians in Corinth of the very basic truths of Christianity. As our substitute, the sinless Son of God offered himself as a sacrifice for the offenses of the people, just as the Old Testament scriptures predicted. The bloody sacrifices that the Old Testament priests offered and the sacrifice of the Passover lamb foreshadowed Christ's uh, voluntary or vicarious atonement. The prophet Isaiah vividly describes the substitutionary nature of Christ's suffering and death in these words. We thought that it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted, but it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt of our sins, for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. After Jesus died, he was laid in the tomb. But God raised him to life and rose victoriously, as God foretold in Psalm 16. Because you will not abandon my life to the grave, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Jesus uses Jonah as a picture of his rising to life again. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Everything happened according to God's loving plan and purpose, as he had promised in the Old Testament. If God says it, it must be true. If God promises it, it will take place. Christ's resurrection is a fact. Remember what you were taught. Your parents may have read Bible lessons to you when you were young, especially the ones about Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. Many of your parents brought you to Sunday school where a faithful instructor taught you that Jesus died for the world's sins, including yours, that his body was buried in a tomb for three days, and that he rose again to defeat death and the devil. In catechism classes, a caring pastor instructed you in the basic truths of Christ's life and these three vital truths that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures were taught to you. Most of you have confessed the three universal creeds, some of you countless times. You are not being brainwashed. The church is not indoctrinating your children with opinions. Don't let college professors question that Jesus died for the sins of the world and convince you that Jesus didn't really die because it would be impossible for him to atone for that many sins. Don't let atheists create doubt in your mind that Christ's resurrection is a myth or a fable. Remember what you were taught, that Christ did indeed rise from uh, again to life. Second, Christ's resurrection is a fact. Listen to the witnesses. Paul shows this by listing those who saw the Savior after he rose from the dead. The list is not comprehensive, but it is impressive. Jesus appeared to Peter to personally uh, assure him of forgiveness after he had so shamefully denied his Savior. 
He appeared to the Twelve, which refers to those who served as his companions for the three years of his public ministry. Paul offers even more proof by writing that Jesus appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. God's word doesn't reveal when or where this happened. Some believe it is a reference to Christ's appearance to his followers in Galilee when he gave the Great Commission. Most of those 500 people were still living when Paul wrote these words. So the Christians in Corinth could check out the accuracy of Paul's words if they really wanted to. Jesus appeared to James, who is the Lord's brother. And while James didn't believe in Jesus at first, he became a leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem and held a prominent position at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. He is also the most likely the author of the epistle of James. And then Jesus appeared to all the apostles, which may have been uh, his first appearance to the twelve after his resurrection. Paul's point is clear. Christ's resurrection is an historical fact. The Corinthians were skeptical. If the Christian Corinthians were skeptical, numerous witnesses could testify to it. How do you prove who you are? How many times a week does someone in our world uh, ask for your identification? This means that you need to show the cashier, the bank teller, the officer, your driver's license, or personal ID. Sometimes you ask for your social security number, or at least the last four digits. Sometimes you have to bring your original birth certificate or a notarized document. But you, you notice that all of these IDs involve paper. In ancient times, paper was very in very limited supply, so the law established the validity of someone's claim by the testimony of two or three witnesses. As it is written in the Law of Moses, a case is to have standing only in the testimony of two or three witnesses. Did you count how many witnesses were listed here? Well, more than three, and over 500 witnesses. That certainly confirms it. The historian Josephus of the early Christian church also testifies that Jesus died and rose again. And finally, many skeptics like the author Lee Strobel, who set out to write a book against Christianity, instead wrote the case for Christ that ended up crediting Christ's death and resurrection, and he became a believer. Third, Christ's resurrection is a fact. See the results. Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me, the stillborn child, so to speak. Literally, he calls himself a miscarriage or an abortion because he doesn't deserve to be called an apostle. Because, as Paul admits, I persecuted God's church. As a miscarried child is not worthy of being called a human being, so the apostle deduces that he is not worthy of being called an apostle. Paul isn't expressing false humility, but a deep sense of how unworthy he felt to be called an apostle. No one had to remind Paul how cruelly he had persecuted God's people. Luke writes in the book of Acts, After receiving authority from the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Because I was so insanely angry with them, I even pursued them to foreign cities. Paul told this account often because it was such a clear display of God's grace. Unless you recognize how atrocious your offenses are and how much you deserve to be punished, you cannot understand or appreciate God's grace. Do you believe that one disobedient act against God's law can sentence you to eternal separation from God? Do you believe that a holy, all-knowing Lord can judge you for your impure thoughts? Do you know that one word of hatred towards your neighbor is the equivalent of murder in God's eyes? If not, you will not fully value God's grace. The self-righteous Pharisee didn't. He didn't repent of his sins. He dismissed them. The Pharisee instead thanked God for not acting like other sinners, instead of thanking God for paying for his sins. Don't think like the Pharisees and the atheists of this world who try to excuse their rebellion of authority, who refuse to believe that there are any laws or standards of behavior that they have to follow or who deny any existence of miracles. After Paul's heart was converted, he repeatedly related this account of how 
Jesus appeared to him on the way to Damascus, on his way to persecute even more Christians. Paul could never grasp how God could love a person like him, the worst of sinners. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But I was shown mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst sinner, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his unlimited patience as an example of those who are going to believe in him, resulting in eternal life. Knowing that he could do absolutely nothing to save himself, Paul was continually amazed that Jesus not only died for his sins, but that he had also called someone like him to be an apostle. And that's why Paul wrote about God's grace so often. I can relate to Paul, who considered himself the worst of sinners. If you have read my biography or have known me for years, my first marriage ended in divorce. Without going into detail, I made many mistakes in that marriage, and God has graciously forgiven me. When people encouraged me to return to the public ministry, I was anxious. I felt tainted, unqualified, and ashamed. But the Lord assured me through pastors and friends that I was forgiven. In time, the leaders of the Michigan District granted me CRM status. And in time, St. Jacob issued a divine call for me to serve the flock, this flock of sheep. By God's grace, I am serving you. And I will always be grateful to the Lord for his amazing love. Can you relate to Paul? Are you the worst of sinners, or do you often do your offenses of God, against God bring you to your knees and cause you to cry out to God? God have mercy on me, a sinner. When you sing Amazing Grace, do you choke on those words that say that saved a wretch like me? It is healthy for us to admit our failures, repent of our sins, and receive the Lord's pronouncement of forgiveness. Paul writes, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not ineffective. God's grace produced fruit in his life. He worked harder and he achieved more than all the other apostles. God's grace inspired him to write 13 epistles and clearly present the teachings of the Christian faith. But Paul says, yet it was not my doing, but it was the grace of God which was with me that did it. If you are a Christian who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus died and was buried. Our Christian faith is based on the historical fact that Jesus was raised to life. Without Christ's resurrection, there is no gospel. The difference between truth and error, fact and unbelief, heaven and hell, and despair and hope and despair depend on the factual event. Christ is risen. Amen. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We join together in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. We pray. Precious Savior Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you that by your suffering on the cross you endured the very agony of hell for us, and that by your death you reconciled us to God. On this day we especially thank you for the resurrection from the dead. For it proves that you are God's Son and seals your sacrifice as the full payment of, for our sins. O oh, Jesus, may we never cease to praise you with our hearts and lips for all that you have graciously done for our salvation that sealed in your resurrection. Ever living Lord, as you were raised up and glorified in your body, raise up uh, us up by the Spirit from his spiritual deadness to trust you with all our hearts and to 
to serve you in godless in godliness all our days. Fill our hearts with joy as we look with longing to the day of your glorious reappearing, when you will raise all the dead from their graves. Comfort us with the knowledge that on that day our vile bodies shall rise in the likeness of your own glorious resurrection body. Our Savior, we need you every moment of every day. Be with us and shower upon us your promised grace and blessings. As our exalted prophet, instruct and encourage our hearts with the gospel of forgiveness and help us grow in faith and the knowledge of salvation. As our exalted high priest, hear us when we pray in your name and intercede at our Father's throne in our behalf. As our exalt, exalted king, watch over us day by day, protecting us from all danger, guarding and keeping us from all evil. Preserve us to your heavenly kingdom by granting us daily repentance and renewal of faith. All of this we ask for the glory of your name, O triumphant Christ, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. We join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close by singing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, 358. Jesus was raised to life, but that Christ's resurrection is a 